this is distributed companies are the future, so if that's not the room that you intended to be in, no offense if you get up and walk out. I will not be offended if you get up and walk out during the presentation either. I get it. Sometimes it's just not hitting you. It's all right. Don't feel bad about it. Um, I am Addison Berry, uh, add one son on the internet, Drupal.org, Twitter, those things. Um, I am the director of education at Lullabot, and I've been with uh, I've been working on Drupal for over eight years. I've been with Lullabot for over seven years. And we have been a fully distributed company from day one since the company started. So I, the entire time I've been at Lullabot, I have always worked from home. Uh, we don't have any office anywhere. Uh, about four years ago, uh, we started a product called Drupalize Me, which is our video training uh, site service. And uh, as the director of education, uh, pretty much Drupalize Me is my world now, and that's where I spend 100% of my time. Um, and uh, I, aside from explaining who I am and what I work on, I also want to point out that uh, Lullabot is a services company, and we've done client services now for eight years. Uh, but we also have a product. And in terms of uh, speaking about distributed companies and how people get work done, Services and products are very different, um, and it has a different impact in terms of, of how your teams work. Um, and uh, we are an unusual company in that we have both. Um, it's not particularly common. Um, so anyway, there's, uh, there's experience on both sides uh, that has been very interesting for me, um, leading a team on a product after working in services for so many years. Um, as I said, we have no central office. We are fully distributed. Everybody works from home. We have 55 people. Uh, we are currently in six countries across seven different time zones. And my team, uh, the Drupalize Me team, is a smaller subset team dedicated within the company. We are eight people in three countries, but we're still across six time zones um, to do all of our work. So just to give you a little context on where I'm coming from with all of this and, and the experiences that I want to share. Um, I'm going to, before I actually dive into talking about this, I want to ask a few questions just to get a sense of who all is in the room. How many people here currently work for a company where someone is working from home, like as their normal, regular thing? Cool, that's a lot of people. How many people wish they worked at a company where you could work from home? <laughs> um, how many folks are managers or business owners versus employees? Cool. OK. Awesome. How many people are in this room because you were at the session before and you're too lazy to leave? <laughs> all right. You know, just trying to like catch my audience. That's all. All right. <laughs> um, so when I put this session forward, it's sort of my universe for, um, for many, many, many years has been working distributed. Uh, and it's, it's funny to me because it's, I take it for granted and I assume that this is the normal way that people do business and have been doing it for a long time. Uh, but often I end up in conversations where people are utterly confused on how I actually get any work done. Um, it's, it's always an interesting conversation piece when I talk with people and they're like, oh, well, so you work for an American company. Like, where's the office? I live in Copenhagen. Um, and it, it's confusing to them. And they're like, well, I work from home. And they're just like horrified. There's like this little like, oh, that sounds weird and un uncanny. So, um, and it's an interesting thing in uh, the Drupal community because our community is online. We work on a product like Drupal, the software. We work on our community, our culture um, online all the time. Um, but even within the Drupal community, people find it strange that you would actually make money this way versus just doing it as a volunteer free thing. So I figured I would uh, try and share some of the experiences that Lullabot has had. We've had a lot of challenges. It's a different way of doing things. And I think the biggest, the first hurdle for everybody is everybody thinks, oh, just have everybody work from home. Hire people, have them work from home. Done. It sounds very simple on the tin. That is not how it works. And 
since it's not that easy, I just sort of want to walk through what it really is like. And what I would like to do is make sure that I end this uh, early enough so that we can have some questions and conversation. I would love to hear from other people what your experiences and challenges have been um, and sort of share that information with each other. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. I want to start off by actually defining what I'm going to talk about beyond this like la 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 because people use different terminology and the title of my presentation is about distributed companies. When I first started working for Lullabot, uh, we called ourselves a virtual company and I, would, I was very, very excited about this job. I was working at Lullabot, I was going to do Drupal full time and I was going to be able to work from home and that was just stunning to me. And I would tell people I worked for a virtual company and I'd be all excited and they'd be like, you don't work for a real company? <laughs> it's like, um, no, it's, it's real. So virtual was a, a really odd word, but it's what we used for quite a long time um, originally in the company. But yeah, people kind of, um, it doesn't sound real. It's, it's, it it uh, eliminates the, the real people aspect of things. It makes it sound like it's all, all fake and all in the ether somewhere. So I don't tend to like to use that term anymore. Another really common one is remote that's used um, a lot. And for me, remote has a very specific meaning, which is that there are a bunch of people in one place and then there's someone else in another place. And that you are removed from where things are really happening. Remote is not a particularly um, comforting word to me as an employee. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm an appendage uh, that's been left off on the side of the road somewhere uh, from where everything else is going on. So for me, when I'm, with my terminology, if I'm speaking of remote companies, those are companies that have an actual physical location and not everybody works at that physical location, which is quite different for me from distributed. Distributed is evenly distributed. Uh, everybody is working separately. You don't have some people congregated and some people not. The significance of this is that you have equal access to communication when you're in a distributed company. Whereas when you're in a remote company, not everybody has equal access to the same information and the communication mechanisms. And that is a huge distinction for me. In this talk, I'm talking about my experience as a distributed company. I, I consider remote companies the hardest nut to crack. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is definitely applicable to a remote situation, but I honestly don't know that I would uh, recommend uh, a, a, a remote situation because to me it sounds really hard to pull off well to create the equality that's really necessary for people to all be on the same page at the same time is really hard. Um, how many people here work with, because there are a lot of hands for working, someone's working from home. How many of you, that, is that a remote situation where there's actually a physical location for your company? Yeah, fair, okay, fair number. How many of you are like truly, fully distributed with no physical location? All right, cool, so a good one there. They're really different. So I just want to be clear about my terminology so you understand what I'm talking about here. And I, I'm not sure if it applies for remote or not sometimes. I'm going to talk about advantages. It's all on one slide. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Most of this presentation is going to be focused on the challenges. Um, that's you know kind of where the rubber meets the road. And I think that's the, the more interesting stuff to kind of dig into. But I do want to run through the advantages. Um, and there are different advantages for different people. So this is just sort of a, a, a generic list, but ones that I have found um, actually applicable for us. Of course, like one of the big things and, and one of the reasons that Lullabot started as a distributed company uh, was, a, was a wider talent pool. For, for us to be able to hire whoever we wanted, let's hire the best people, um, but not be limited by location. Because not everybody wants to move to the same city. Um, trying to look for talent in one city is really hard. Trying to look for talent in one country is hard. Um, I live in Copenhagen uh, and the, the Danish uh, 
system or you know group of people there, like finding Drupal developers, experienced Drupal developers is really hard. It's extremely competitive. Um, so we have a much, much wider range of people that we can hire. Uh, lower overhead costs. I don't have an office. We aren't paying for all of that uh, stuff to keep the lights on. We have a company of 55 people. That's a pretty substantial space uh, that would be necessary in a regular office. There's an asterisk there because we're going to come back to that because uh, in some ways that is a false uh, assumption for a lot of people. We don't have an office, but we have other costs that can uh, balance that out. But I'll come back to that later. Uh, business continuity. A lot of people don't think about this, um, but when you have an earthquake or a flood um, and all your systems go down, um, power outages in cities like it has happened in New York, um, you, everything is gone. Your entire company is offline. Whereas our distributed team, just because somebody's affected in one city or in one block of the city, um, the rest of the company is still functioning and we can reroute the work that needs to happen. Um, we've had instances where our clients have had a problem uh, locally and they have gone offline, uh, but we're still working and then, but there's no way for us to communicate with them and actually keep things moving forward because their localized place has gone down. So it's useful. Um, more time zone coverage. Um, as a product, this is really awesome for us. Um, it extends our support coverage. Uh, but it's also for, even for services teams, being able to hand things off to people, um, doing some work in the morning and then going to bed and then waking up and somebody's already worked on it. Yes, love it. Um, but again, there's an asterisk there because time zones are also tricky. <laughs> we'll come back to that in the challenges section. Um, better communication skills. If you're a distributed team, people have to communicate and they have to communicate well and it has to be something that you actually put a lot of effort into. You can't just assume communication happens. And it actually makes you overall, as a company and as a team, better communicators. We've had people come work for Lullabot who are stunned at the level of communication and feel that they have way more understanding what's going on and more connections and ties with their coworkers in a distributed company than they did when they worked in an office because we focus so much on communication and people have to up their game if they're gonna be successful with us. Um, and then wider cultural perspective and experience. I mean, there's tons of studies out there on diversity within a team does lots of different things, some of it subtle and some of it not so subtle that will improve the overall quality of your team. And it's like one of those things that's easy to kind of take for granted that, oh yeah, you know, I've got people and uh, you know, they came they're from East London and they're from West London. I mean, we know those are two completely different cultures, right? Um, but being able to have like people in widely different areas, not just uh, time zones or countries, um, even like are they urban or are they in rural areas? It's amazing the perspective that people bring to their experience. Um, we often, <laughs> it's interesting just having people from different countries or who, who uh, speak different languages it's simple things like our marketing materials. Um, we have a filter of that doesn't make any sense because it's so American centric um, that it doesn't make sense outside of an American who would be reading it. And that improves our overall product and the work that we're doing. Um, so it's something I think a lot of people dismiss, but this, to me this is actually one of, a, it's a huge advantage of being able to spread out the team that we hire. All right. Let's talk about challenges, because it all sounds great on paper, right? Before I get into specific practical things, I want to start with this one, which is a very high level thing, which is trust. Trust is a root of a lot of the challenges that you're going to encounter. Does does your client trust that you're going to actually like, show up for work and get work done? Do you trust your employees to do what they need to do without you seeing them do it? Do your employees trust that you have any clue what's going on when you're not actually there with them with the client? You've got to build trust. 
And like that's true, I think, of any team in any circumstance, whether you're co-located or not. But the distributed nature highlights that and can cause a lot more problems if you don't have solid trust uh, within your company and within your team. It is, can be a real problem. So at the end of the day, a lot of it does come back down to trust. can't really be a micromanager in a distributed company. Okay, so on to actual like practical, oh gosh, I don't know how to do this. Um, legitimacy, are you actually a real business? That whole virtual thing I said, like people are like, so you don't have an office, you're not really a business, right? You're in like your mom's basement, right? Um, you get that reaction from clients and from potential employees. Um, it's, a, it's a thing. We've definitely had uh, clients who were just like, yeah, so you, you don't have an office, right? Where are we supposed to meet you? And then it just comes down to education. And you're not gonna be able to educate and convince everybody, and then you just need to move on. But I do think that uh, the more we talk about the work that we do in the way that we do it is very useful for moving that stuff forward. We have case studies. Um, there are other companies out there who are distributed and very successful. Automatic um, is another example. They are a huge company. They have hundreds of employees fully distributed. Um, and they are very successful. And so being able to point to those things and adding to that literature out there, um, we write blog posts about the stuff that we do. I would love to see more people writing about what it is and how you work because that only helps all of us be able to legitimize ourselves. Lullabots, you know, we have a huge reputation and, and we're one of the top uh, web shops out there. So we have that, but back in the day, we had to just sort of work on it and build our reputation by doing the work. And I think one of the biggest things that helps with that process is in the initial re interactions with people, whether they are potential employees or clients, highlight the actual advantage of the distributed nature, which is communication. A lot of people take stuff for granted. If you actually show people, I mean, communication is bizarre. Like how people, people can be stunned because you actually communicate well and effectively and you don't waste people's time. It's amazing. Um, and so I really think that like just be professional and communicate and teaching people how you communicate and how they should communicate better that in and of itself is uh, an enlightening experience, I think, for a lot of clients. So it's a hard, this is a tough nut to crack, though, if you have people who are really skeptical. And I'm, it's interesting. I find that, uh, and this just might be my experience and perception, but I feel like in, uh, in Europe, it is, uh, there's more resistance to the distributed uh, work system than in, in the US. It's been really interesting and enlightening for me living in Europe and I, the reactions from people is a lot more like, really? That can't possibly be a real thing. Um, so it can be tough. I do think that you need to just talk about it uh, with other people and add to the literature so that we can all, like you guys can use Lullabot's experience to help you establish legitimacy for the way that you wanna work. We're cool with that. Hiring, it's different when people don't come into the office and shake your hand and sit down across the desk and talk to you. It's awesome because you have this huge pool. You know, we get applications from all over the place. It's amazing. And it certainly helps to, to get that bigger pool. But when it, you actually get to the hiring process, um, you have to modify your hiring process a little bit and not just like, yeah, you're gonna have like, you know, a video hangout or, you know, whatever the online tool is that you're using to communicate. But when you're hiring, most people hire for skill and cultural fit, you know, sort of your standard things I'm gonna hire for. But now you also have to hire for the ability to work in a distributed team. It's a specific thing that you need to look for. Not everybody is cut out to work in a distributed team, really. And they might not even know it. It's your job when you're hiring to figure that out or be prepared to deal with it. Some people can't, they just can't handle it. Um, 
they end up not working because it's too hard. They're not disciplined enough to actually get their work done without somebody standing over them. Sometimes they work way too much and they burn themselves out, which can be equally dangerous. Um, so it's one of those things that like, you actually have to put this into a checklist of things that you are assessing when you are talking to somebody. Um, the kinds of questions that they ask, figuring out what their fears are about working in a distributed, would be amazed in the number of interviews we have. The number one thing that comes out is if people are very hesitant about the distributed nature of coming to work for us and they have a lot of fear about how it's going to work. And having, having that conversation and being very open about it in the interview process is going to save both of you a lot of pain. So something you need to, to really pay attention to. Uh, we do have, uh, we, years and years ago, we started to ask for people to submit a video when they submit their application to us. Um, it's not a hard and fast requirement, but as a general rule, uh, it's highly suggested. And it helps us get a sense of the person during just the interview, like before we even get to the interview process, through the screening process. Um, but we also do hangouts now, so we do video interviews. For a long time, it was only Skype. Um, and it's not, part of it is, of course, you just want you need to get a sense of a person. You need to have some sense of cultural fit and, you know, facial expressions and things like that. But there's also, honestly, there's a whole element of can they actually use the tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis? Can they figure Skype out? Can they figure Hangouts out if they've not done that before? Can they do it? Because it's going to be really important on our day-to-day -day work. I know uh, over at Automatic and part of their hiring process, they actually um, have um, it's Skype chat text interviews because they use that as their main tool most of the day for communication and they need to know that you can communicate and understand what's going on purely through text. And so they use it as part of their interview process so that they can weed that out pretty quickly. Um, so using the tools that you use in your day-to-day -day work in your interview process can really help you assess and sort of narrow down people who can actually figure it out and be able to work with those tools properly. Um, another thing that we do uh, at Lullabot is we have Lullabuddies. So everyone's assigned, every new hire is assigned a Lullabuddy. Um, so somebody else in the company, they don't have to be some like old veteran of the company. They're there just to, you know, can you get into IRC? Have you, do you know where you're supposed to be for the team call on Monday? Um, just reaching out and making sure that people get through those initial pieces. Because again, you have this, once you hire somebody and you're onboarding them, how do they figure out what's going on without you know, shadowing a person, walking around the office with them? Um, it's harder for people to create the personal connections. Uh, when you first start working and you're in the office, the personal connections that you end up making with people are those things that you lean on very early. But we don't have that in-person thing. So you really have to be proactive about creating a personal connection and giving someone basically an internal support network within the company that they can rely on very early on in the process. Um, it's very easy for people to end up feeling overwhelmed and isolated uh, when they start to onboard, uh, unless they've worked in a distributed fashion before. We find it happens quite often. Um, so hiring process, a little different. You have to pay attention to that stuff. And the decisions you make in the hiring process affect all the other things that happen, all the other challenges that are going to happen. You need to have people who can work in a distributed environment and can thrive in that environment. A lot of all this stuff comes down to, of course, communication. And of course, trust, that initial issue, that big kind of root challenge, a lot of trust is built through communication. You've got to communicate well. So I'm gonna, there's, I have a couple of slides on communication because there are a bunch of different challenges around it. I'll start with collaboration, how you actually work together. So Jared Ponchot is our creative director and he recently wrote a, an article and he had these sort of three points in terms of how we try to structure our communication. Write liberally, chat frequently, congregate occasionally. Um, 
we have a lot of written communication in our company. And it's interesting, I mean, like when someone submits an application, the way that they write, even at the very beginning, it matters. And it's like, you know, they can be, someone can be an amazing developer or an amazing designer, but if they can't articulate in written form, it's gonna be very difficult to be successful in a distributed company because so much of our communication is in writing. Um, chat frequently. We talk a lot, um, touching base with each other. Uh, we use lots of different tools for that, whatever, you know, Skype, Hangouts. Um, but the keeping that like real time, figuring stuff out, obviously you need to have that stuff in place. And then congregate occasionally is actually getting together in person. But you can't do it all the time, obviously, or you defeat sort of the purpose of being a distributed company. Um, and the way that we kind of break down these, where you're doing what with these three things, and this is actually this asynchronous and synchronous uh, stuff came from a conversation that we had with um, Brian uh, over at uh, GitHub. And uh, asynchronous is tactical work, synchronous is strategic work. With the asynchronous work, this is the day-to-day, -day, like tactical, get the job done, the work that needs to happen. And this is very, um, it's designed to get out of people's way. You need to communicate, but do you need to be distracting people all day long when you communicate with them? Let people organize their information the way that they need to. If it's not like some kind of critical thing, like if someone needs to do a task, do I have to tell them on the phone to do the task? Not really, I don't. It can be in an email and they can parse it and deal with it when the time is right for them to deal with it. The synchronous stuff is strategic. This is the kind of thing that you don't wanna have an email thread that goes on for two weeks and has like 200 emails long to try and do brainstorming or figure out a larger vision for something. That ends up being really awkward. Um, and so synchronous stuff where you actually get on the phone and talk with somebody or get on a hangout and have conversations should be directed more towards strategic work, larger picture things. I will also say that the synchronous stuff is not just strategic, it's also cultural but I'm gonna talk more about culture a little bit later. Um, the point being with, with this is picking the correct mode of communication to be efficient. Because a lot of people end up being on the phone all day long and then not getting any work done and it's not necessary. So it's not just learning how to communicate, how do I write the words, how do I share this information with somebody. It's making sure you're using the right mode of communication at the right time to accomplish the task that you're trying to do. And it really requires stepping back and actually being deliberate about the decision. We spend a lot of time reassessing this on a regular basis. I would say that we probably have conversations about our phone calls at least once a month or every other month. Are we having too many phone calls? Should we change the way that we're doing the phone calls? What, are people showing up to calls without agendas? Like, what's going on? Are, is this regularly scheduled call that was really awesome six months ago, is this actually still a useful phone call or is it just disrupting everybody's day now? Um, it's a constant conversation for us. It's crazy, but it's true. Um, we have been spending a lot of time talking about our communication, which is just weird. Um, so, when it comes to collaboration and distributed teams and dealing with communication tools, think about it. Don't just like, we, I mean, we send a lot of email. We say uh, email liberally in our company. You should CC. Uh, if you're not sure, see some, CC somebody. Let them handle it with their filters and stuff like that. But you, you need to think about the communication and why are you doing it this way? Why are you scheduling a hangout? Make sure you have a good answer for that before you do it. It's really disruptive to people's days. And then of course we have uh, the ultimate synchronous communication, which is actually in-person stuff, getting together in the same location. We do this quite often. Uh, when we kick off something with a client, we will often go on site with the client for the first few days or week of a project, get everybody on the same page, make sure everybody understands what's going on at the high level before we start diving into everyday tactical tasks uh, with that client. 
Uh, we meet at conferences like this. There are a whole bunch of Lullabots that are here. Um, and we end up working on things. Maybe sometimes it's you know the next stupid funny module, but hey, we're working on it together. Um, and we do a lot of retreats. We get together, and it's our entire company gets together once a year. We fly everybody together in the same location. We spend a week together. But all of the uh, teams, all the departments also have retreats where they get together and focus on the tasks that they need to do. And that, the amount of work that we can get done in two or three days of just sitting down and sprinting together is amazing. But again, we try to focus that so it's not necessarily so tactical, but more like what are the, what are the brainstorming that things that need to happen? What are the larger issues? How do we figure out the tricky parts where real-time communication with each other is gonna accelerate us a lot faster than trying to figure out an email form? And then you can split things off and then have tactical tasks that get done after the fact. Um, it's funny, we get together, we love getting together. It's also a, a cultural thing and it's like just fun. Uh, we really enjoy hanging out with each other. Um, but after a few days of working on something, once all the big picture stuff has been figured out, I find, at least on my team, uh, people want to go home and so they can get work done. <laughs> um, we actually want to like get back to our space and our zone where we have more control of asynchronous communication so we can focus on work and actually just start to bang things out. It's fascinating uh, how that works. Um, this is a problem. Isolation, well, I hope you all know isolation means feeling like you're separated, but submarining is the term that we use for people who just sort of slowly, quietly disappear. <laughs> and you're just like, I swear there's someone on our team called Joe. <laughs> um, but what's, it's funny because it's, it's strange how easily it can happen without you really noticing that someone has disappeared. Um, their communication drops off. They're getting their tasks done even, but all of a sudden they just aren't like a presence anymore. And it can happen for a lot of reasons. Personal stuff going on, distractions, just feeling overwhelmed by all of the things, like all the communication mechanisms. Um, whatever the reasons are, it's your job, and your, I mean, not just like owners and not just bosses, everybody on a distributed team, it's everyone's responsibility to be aware of this, look for that, and be able to identify it. Think about who would be most susceptible to having these kinds of things happen. I know within Lullabot, um, our consultants, so we have on client services, we have development teams, um, and often we have a whole team of people that work on a, a client project together. And we also have consultants uh, and architects who often will work with the client alone because the client has their own internal team and they are just there to advise them and consult with them. So our consultants often work without any other Lullabots. And it's, it's ripe for isolation and feeling like you're cut off from the rest of the, the culture and what, are, what other people are doing. And even things like, if you think about the roles that people are in, um, on our team, so the video site, uh, there are three of us, the one in one video editor. We're only one video editor in the entire company. He doesn't really have anybody that he can like nerd out with about video editing stuff. stuff. Um, and so, part of, part of a team, and, and, and we all collaborate and work together a lot, but there's an element of the role and the job that he's doing that feels different from everybody else, and that can, that can create a certain sense of isolation. Um, and so, what, I, what I've done in that particular situation is we've actually hired a, uh, a part-time contract editor to help, to help with our workload, I and mean, it's not, not you know, a random, random decision. decision. He did help with our, with our editing work as well, well, but also, but also he gives me somebody else to talk about video editing things. We get all, get all excited about some, some thing, we get out, get out, but we have to clean the thing, we have to clean the thing. Yeah, that, yeah, that. But thinking about these about things, things, like looking for where are, where are people, what is going, what going on, on in people's, people's roles, um, um, or, or teams of teams that you're working on, or not working in a team. And being, and being actually, actually thinking about that, trying to drag your head around and having honest conversations, conversations 
lot of time zones. I'm in Copenhagen, Central European, and we, and, uh, <laughs> we have uh, team members in uh, London, and then East Coast U.S., and Central U.S., and Mountain U.S., and Pacific U.S. Um, the time difference between myself and my, my West Coast team member is it's, it's a nine-hour time zone difference in the day. Um, but it works, totally works for us. And I said, like, you know, back in the advantages, this is actually a really nice advantage because you have this huge range of time that people are working. And so some work's happening while you're sleeping and then you're working and it's great in the handoff. But you have to have some rules around time zones and how they're going to affect your company or else it is really gonna bite you in the ass. Um, we have a kind of base time zone within Lullabot, which is US Eastern time. That's sort of like, you know, it's, uh, it's in terms of our time zone spread, um, it's kind of in the middle, it's roughly in the middle-ish, so that works. Um, it's where the owners have been living for a while, so like when we were smaller, that was sort of the focus of the time zones uh, at that time. But the thing about having that base time zone like when we hire someone, when we interview people, this is already an expectation. When you come to work for Lullabot, you are going to have to work in what a US Eastern time zone work day would look like for at least part of the day. There has to be some kind of overlap. You have to have time for synchronous communication within your company. Now how much that is it's up to you, but I really feel strongly that you've got to have that on a regular basis, not once a week or something like that. It has to be a regular thing where people can reach out and just talk to each other when they need to. You need to establish what that minimum overlap is for your company. Um, we don't have a hard and fast rule, but uh, for example, I work in my local time zone from about 11 in the morning till around 7, sometimes 8 in the evening depending on my schedule. Um, whereas, you know, Amber is gonna have to get up, she's on the, the Pacific Coast, um, she's gonna have to get up at eight in the morning sometimes, that's just how it is. Uh, but she knew that when she was hired, that's cool. That's the decision that you make. Um, everybody's gonna have to compromise to some degree 
well, maybe except for people who live in the base time zone. I don't know, but um, it hasn't been the case for me a lot. Of, um, and also keep in mind that just because someone's willing to be really flexible with their schedule, it, that's not always good. Just because someone's um, willing to work at 2 a.m. because that overlaps the window that you guys have doesn't mean that that's actually a good time for them to work. It could be. Maybe their spouse like works the night shift, and so their family is just generally a we stay up all night kind of thing. Um, that's cool, but you should understand that in the hiring process. You know, if people have like lives and families, but they really want this job, and they say they'll work at two in the morning, and they're like completely exhausted um, when they're trying to get work done for you, that just it's not cool. Um, I would recommend starting with a base time zone and not going really far out of that initially. I mean, within Europe, three time zones, and you got the kind of the whole, the whole nice big selection right there. You don't need to go like crazy with the time zones. Um, I've definitely known some people who are like, "Yay, we're going to be distributed, and we're going to hire people anywhere in the world." And then you have people all over the world, and nobody can ever talk to each other. Um, it, and it's hard. Like that's really frustrating. I also I traveled um, quite a lot for a period of time uh, before I ended up settling down, and. Uh, there were times when my time zone was further away than it really should be. Um, I have found the times that I have been in, uh, in Asia and Australia really isolating. I didn't have enough time to have synchronous communication with the other people on my team. My company felt that I wasn't present, um, and I felt really disconnected. You need to figure out what, those, what that area is, and it's going to be limited. I feel, at least from my perspective, um, to be really effective. At this point, Lullabot generally sticks to the Americas uh, and, and European time zones. Um, it's, it's really difficult to have somebody on the opposite side of the planet um, trying to communicate with you. It doesn't really work that well. So that's what we have at this point. Also, I will say that my team, being the product team, is a lot more flexible. Uh, than our client services team because of clients. Clients' expectations are also, we've definitely had clients say, we do not want to work with that employee because of their time zone, because the client didn't feel like the communication was going to be enough. Um, so that has definitely bitten us in the butt before. So, but with products, you know, I get to make the decisions. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm the client. And then we have culture. Um, this is a Vine video. It won't last. I, didn't, I don't have it on loop, so you won't be distracted by it forever. Um, so this, is, this, is a, this was just made this summer <laughs> um, at our uh, design and developer retreat. It's one of those uh, team uh, retreats. And uh, this, is a, this is like a, this is a, a company meme thing. Sometimes you'll start at the company and people will chant um, or they'll type into Yammer. So it'll be like, Addy, 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 Addy. And new people are like, holy shit, you people are fucking crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're just like, where have I come to work? What are you people doing? So it's like, it's a thing. But it comes from this game that we played at a company retreat a couple years ago. It was just a game. It was fun. We had a really good time. Um, you play rock, paper, scissors. And then whoever wins, the other people have to get behind and chant their name and support their champion. And then you get down to the last person, and then the whole company is chanting one person's name. It's a fun game. It doesn't mean anything. But now it's a thing. Um, but you know, for new people who get hired, it's not a thing, and it's weird. <laughs> um, transferring that kind of company lore and keeping the culture is really important. And this is, I mean, this is true in any company, right? Like whether you're distributed or not. Again, I think this is just an instance where the distributed nature of things can exacerbate a problem um, if, with, if you don't have strong culture to begin with or good communication about it. Um, but you need to, again, you need to be proactive and think about creating a space for people to share who they are. Um, Create your water cooler. Uh, we use Yammer. People post all kinds of random stuff in there. I mean, some of it's work-related. Some of it is definitely not. <laughs> um,
but it's our place to share and it's an asynchronous place. So even if I'm not online when this really funny joke or thread just you know happened, uh, the next morning when I wake up, it's there and I can read it and I'm still part of that whole experience. Um, or when people are like, you know, what are you eating for lunch today? Uh, picture thread, you know? Well, you know, it's way beyond lunch for me at that point probably, um, but that doesn't mean lunch next day, I can't add my picture. So um, that's the space that we've tried to create for sort of our online water cooler so that everybody can, again, have that equal access to communication versus people in an office did this thing and I wasn't there and oops, so well, tough. Um, and we also, the, the in-person stuff is really important. You're going to spend money to get people together in a successful distributed company. And that's what sort of like, you don't have an office, but you're gonna invest that money in your people directly um, by letting them get together. It costs money. I mean, we fly 55 people from all over the world to one location and, and hang out and party for a week. Um, it costs money to do that, but it's really important the strategic stuff, those larger conversations, that like from a, a work and collaboration perspective is really important. But from culture, it's, you know, this is the foundation for our context, for how we communicate when we're online. It resets the way we communicate with each other. <laughs> if, I, if I know that you are a very sarcastic person and I have a sense of your humor, when you write sarcastic things and you sound like an ass, I know you're not really an ass. You're just being you know, sarcastic in written form. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's night and day. It makes a huge difference in how you read people and how you interact with people. Having the physical in-person interactions with people to set the context for who that they are as a round full individual rather than just the words they write is huge. Um, so we get together a lot. Um, I'm on the Drupal Eyes Me team, education side. We travel probably more than most of the people in the rest of the company. I'm also a director. So I, I travel at least 10 times a year. Um, most of that is to the US. I have gold status. <laughs> yeah, that's another tip. Sign up for any of your frequent flyer stuff if you can have a distributed company. Um, that's just, yeah. But anyway, for culture and being able to have those things pass on, you need to have an asynchronous place where culture is captured that people can access and catch up and see sort of what's going on and be a part of it. And you need to have real in-person getting to know the human beings in a much broader picture than your daily work life. And you really need to encourage people to communicate outside of the boundaries of the, the t work task that you're doing. Having fun together as a company. You know, and that tone is set by everybody. So if everybody's only posting in Yammer about work tasks, then that's what everybody else is gonna do and it's gonna get really boring really fast. <laughs> um, so you need to, again, like actively, proactively encourage that culture, make sure the place is well-defined and then use it um, and make, turn it into that. Um, and you, we can totally teach you the entourage game. It's pretty fun. We do it at every event now. And the new people are always like, what's going on? This is really, oh, Joe, 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 Joe. So just to kind of like wrap this up, I do feel like the distributed nature of working is the future. We're moving in that way. Our lives are online. We expect access and flexibility. I know I do in my personal life. I wanna be able to just look stuff up or go here and do this thing at three in the morning if I want to. Um, and so more and more clients are expecting to be able to have that kind of access and flexibility and that you are going to, of course, just because they don't work in the same city as you. I mean, why can't you get my work done? You should be able to. Um, employees, like, they expect to be able to live the lives that they want to live. Um, it's just, it's, it's where we're going as a, as a culture. Um, and so I feel like if we want to improve our businesses, if we want to be able to serve the clients that we want to serve to make our money, and we want to have the teams of people that we need to accomplish those goals, we need to get 
on the train with this. And we come from an open source community that already does this. So it, it's strange to me that like just because there's like a business money thing involved, all of a sudden that falls apart for some reason. So that's sort of my my whole take. Um, we've been doing this at Lullaby for eight years, and it just to me feels normal. And the fact that it's still something considered futuristic is strange to me. Um, but I do think that it's something that helping drive Drupal forward, helping drive businesses forward, is a very symbiotic relationship. And we already come from a culture that can do this. Why shouldn't we lead the pack with Drupal rather than sitting back while other people sort of try and figure this out and make it up? Why can't we be leaders in how this is supposed to work and how you can do it right and how you can do amazing things in the web world? I feel like that's something we should own because it's right there in front of us. If you would like to read more stuff uh, about distributed stuff, we blog about it quite a bit. Um, LB, that's an L, the font is just looking funny, but lb.cm slash distributed. Um, that is uh, all of the distributed posts on our blog. Um, we talk about it a lot, and I would love to talk to people. We also do have, a, there's a conference called Yonder IO. Um, I didn't t talk about that a lot here. It's, it's mostly invite only. It's a very, very small conference that we started last year, which is distributed company owners getting together to talk about all this stuff. Um, some of the stuff I talked about, like I said, we've talked to, you know, like things we've learned from Automatic and GitHub and other uh, large distributed companies um, and how they're doing things. Um, so you can read more about that yonder and stuff like that on our blog as well. So I have 10 minutes, eight minutes maybe, um, for questions and chatting and people sharing thoughts. I'd really love to hear what other people have to say. And then I'll finish up also by the classic rate your session thing um, to help improve the Drupal cons. Um, you guys should use the microphone. So you're gonna have to stand up, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, go to the mic, go to the mic. Uh, the uh, Drupal Eyes Me uh, videos have gone from the rather tasteful 1970s orange curtains to a kind of Apple-esque white background. I just wondered how technically you do the white background when you don't have like a studio in, in each of your houses, or maybe you do. Yeah, we do distributed video uh, recording, right? Um, I use a blank white wall. Uh, other people, we do actually have people, uh, every trainer has a backdrop kit. But the more important thing is not the background, but it's that we have a full lighting kit. Um, so each trainer has a lighting kit at home and I know how to set it all up and that's what I do and then I record my stuff and send it off to the editor. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. The one thing that blocks me and, um, in my experience, uh, my teams around me is uh, this doctrine in, in Scrum especially that uh, you have to sit in one room and uh, look at a white, uh, whiteboard and have post-its and not write anything electronically because this is so 90s. So <laughs> the trend seems to be having post-its on a wall and everybody sitting in a small room. And is, what's your experience with Scrum, especially? Well, yeah, we don't really do Scrum that way. I don't. My team doesn't. Um, we have an extremely different project management style all around, though, for, for our projects. And it's um, it, we actually don't have a project manager. Um, we have prioritization and self-assignment. Um, but we're a small team, and I trust them to know what needs to get done. And we do it together, because it's all sink or swim for all of us. Um, but yeah, so I actually don't have like, personal experience with Scrum. I know that there are lots of tools we used to. For a little while, we were working with Scrum stuff. And so we had like, um, you know, basically online sticky noting things to do stand-ups like on a Hangout or on a call and stuff like that. Um, but honestly, I don't personally have a lot of experience. We've, we've moved away from that model entirely, actually. Your story is mainly based um, on having people as employees. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will be um, um, a rather different 
when you try to do it with independent persons, bringing them together on a project base and expanding and working together? I think, I think it's less about whether they're an employee or a contractor. I think the, the amount of time, like if it's a short term, you know, two months and you're constantly bootstrapping new people into things, then the continuity ends up being a problem, but I think that's just true generally. Um, it again comes back to are these people who can communicate using the tools they need to communicate with and are they good communicators um, and and working with them to learn how they should communicate like making it a thing an understood task like you're not just a developer you also are a communicator and um, and we can help you figure that out but it's a thing and it's something you have to do and if that doesn't work then it doesn't work. And it's more about that than it is about whether you're an employee or a contractor. Uh, hi. So we are a distributed company as well. We've got people in uh, 11 different cities. Uh, there are times when there's a lot of pressure, if, you know, and productivity is not coming up, and often team members have come up to me and said, can we fly back, you know, down to one particular place, all of us, and get this to job done a weekend back. Mm -hmm. How often does that happen uh, with uh, Lullabot? And if not, are we doing something wrong here? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we, so in terms of like, right now, like, so we have the one all company thing, right? And then like my team gets together once a year and the directors get together twice a year. Again, that's sort of that strategic thing. Um, in terms of like people who are working on projects together, if it's like aside from like a client on site, our teams don't tend to get together physically to work on stuff a whole lot. Um, that said, we the, the the owners and directors we have been talking about um, modifying our budget for travel to allow for more more people getting together at different times and for it to be more spontaneous. Um, when something happens in a project and it really is going to actually get people over that hump, uh, we would like to have budget to make sure that that can happen. Um, so we, we're, I think we're still playing with the balance of that. Um, I know at GitHub they do it extensively. Um, it's a big thing that they do uh, where they will just rent out a space and send every, a team that's working on a project and just kick something out for three or four days and then go home again. Um, and so we've been definitely talking about how we can actually incorporate more of it. But I would say, again, like as a rule for like specific projects, it actually doesn't happen that often right now. So if you say you have no project manager, but you work with prioritization and self-assignment, who prioritizes? Um, who, who, I do. Who gives the priorities? I do. I'm the, so the but product But you're not owner. the manager? N right, well, hmm. it's in the sense we don't have project management or a project manager in the sense that I don't assign tickets. Um, and we don't, we used to load up a sprint. We have a two week sprint, we do this thing, then we release that sprint. And now it's just a constantly rotating, um, we release every Wednesday depending on how much work managed to get done in the dev branch and then QA'd before the Wednesday release goes out. And that's what's in there and we do it every week. Um, so we've just changed utterly that stuff. But when new tickets are created, um, I review the tickets every day, or if I'm not available, it's called the gatekeeper role. Um, reviews the ticket, makes sure that there is um, an acceptable QA um, written. So each ticket has to have the, what, what the QA is to test it once it gets through. Um, so you have to make sure that's acceptable and then basically you know, categorizing it. Where bucket does it go in? Is this really important? Does, should it be listed as high priority? Is it a hot fix? Oh my God. Um, go through that stuff every day. But then essentially the tickets are there. It's actually, this is gonna get into a whole big project management thing. So, but we actually have a roadmap uh, where there's a prioritization on like for this quarter, these are the things that we want to accomplish as a team. Um, but people can work on anything they want. So if they're getting really burned out on working on the new library page, then they can go find something that they just are excited about or bugs the crap out of them. Uh, and they can go work on that for a couple of days um, and refresh themselves. So I don't tell people what to work on. I just, we just communicate what we all think is important. It would make us sad if it didn't happen. 
Uh, hi, I have, uh, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, first, uh, from your blog is uh, share that what kind of collaboration tools that you guys are using as well about for like, I don't know, uh, backlog and then communication, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, social intranet. And the second question is, uh, is it mandatory to have a good internet connections to work for long <laughs> because uh, for European and US people, that's pretty, uh, you take it for granted to have internet connections. Yeah. Uh, but uh, s like most of the rest of the world doesn't have uh, internet connections. Yep. And because uh, I've been doing this, you know, uh, communications and then the biggest problem is trying to use Skype to have a good uh, communication with other people in uh, less, uh, you know, less developed country that no connect internet connections. Yeah, good question. So first question, we use a lot of tools and we're kind of constantly reassessing the tools that we use. I could give you a list now and six months later it could be different. Um, but we do, like right now, we, we use Yammer for our internal communication. Um, at this time. <laughs> uh, we use IRC for chat. There's been a lot of talk of Slack. We've looked at lots of different uh, chat tools and it's, you know, it's a bunch of nerds. We play with every new toy that comes out and see which ones are gonna work for us. And then we get into heated arguments over which one's better. And then somebody comes in and says, no, we're using this. Um, and then, you know, six months later, we reevaluate it all again. Um, we use Hangouts pretty extensively now. A uh, lot of Skype. Um, and I would say those are kind of our main tools. I would say that's our the big stuff. But like I said, there's we're always playing with tools. It's sort of keeping your eye on that. Like I remember when Yammer came out, and I was like, oh, Yammer, what is this thing? Um, but now we use it as like a backbone for our communication. Um, and then people get really pissed off, and we go try and find an alternative, and then we go back to using what we're using. But so yeah, in terms of, I mean, I think on the in our, in our blog, we may talk about some of the tools, but it changes so much that it's not like we have like a list of tools we use, because it can change quite a bit. Um, in terms of the internet connection thing, um, yeah, you gotta have a decent internet connection, um, at least for part of the day when you need to have synchronous communication. It doesn't have to be all the time. I lived in, um, in Montevideo, Uruguay for a while, and this is that beauty of you know, it's winter time. I'm going to go live in South America because it's warm. Um, and it was great. I lived down there for about two and a half months. The internet was, was shit. Um, it was really hard. Um, and I ended up in an internet cafe for phone calls, um, you know, for a few hours pretty much every day. I went, I did that thing, and then I just went and worked mostly offline the rest of the time. Um, but and it, it was frustrating to me because I'm used to just, oh, you know, internet should just work. Uh, anywhere you go in the world. Doesn't quite work that way. Um, but I would say, so yeah, it's difficult, I think, to be distributed, again, without being able to have synchronous communication at some point. It doesn't have to be all the time. And if, it's, if, it's, if there's problems with internet for the communication, stuff like that, it's a matter of just setting up the schedule and the time and making sure that you do create the space and that people can do that. I feel like you need to have that to some degree but you think you can get creative over how to handle it. Yep, last question. I, well, you know, it's late. I know everybody probably wants to go have their beer now. <laughs> Hi, thanks for a great session. Um, I have a question about office space. Uh, even though you're a, a distributed company, uh, mm -hmm. I know a lot of employees would probably prefer, or at least I know a lot of freelancers who prefer working in a shared office space. Mm -hmm. uh, do you support that or is it uh, strictly your work from home policy type thing? People can work anywhere they want. Um, so, uh, and I know some people in Lullabot do like to go to a shared space. Um, a lot of people like to go work in cafes so they're around other people or there's other things that are happening. Um, one of the things we are discussing is um, to supplement uh, funding for that for employees who do want to have a, have a, works, a shared workspace um, to help them afford that. Um, because it is, you know, part of their their work. Um, I'm not sure where uh, the conversations on that are, but it is something we're discussing is to actually financially support that for people. Okay, but you haven't for the past eight years. No, but we okay. haven't. Yeah, it's it's been. If you want to do that, that's great. Your choice. Okay. Do what you want. Fine. Thanks. Just a very quick question. <clears throat> 
how do you um, differently define a set of freelancers working together versus a distributed company? And is that just who pays whose tax, or is, it, is there more to it? Wow, yeah, this gets into a whole other world of the distributed company, which is HR and administration. Um, and that is, it can be a pain. I guess it depends where you are. In the US, if you are in different states, things like health insurance uh, companies like to work in regions, um, not countries. Um, and so even within the US, even if you're in the same country and you have people in different places, it took us, it took us over a year to find a health insurance company that understood what we were trying to do <laughs> and would help us. But so in terms of like, yeah, like an employee, it's like who's handling all of that stuff, all that overhead. Um, and that, that is a whole other world of stuff you have to figure out with a distributed company versus being contractors and everybody figures it out on their own and that's cool. Not everybody who works full time at Lullabot is an employee. Um, and that's because setting up HR and admin and taxes in every country is expensive uh, and annoying. Um, so we um, have employees and we are set up for payroll in the United States, Canada, the UK, and Denmark. Um, but we do have people who are working in Spain and India, but they are contractors um, because we are not set up for payroll uh, uh, there. So, uh, and it's the kind of thing that Again, we sort of need to have like a, it, it just becomes like a, a, an investment question in terms of how much money and time we want to set doing that. But yeah, so we do actually have, technically they are contractors, but they are treated as, as an employee culturally, communication wise. We fly them with everybody else, all of that kind of a thing. So, yeah. Cool, well thanks everybody. It's gone over, I appreciate it. Enjoy your con.